Wow, what a beautiful thing to be here again on the Marvelous Believer Show. And I know you are blessed. I am also so blessed and so excited to be here because I know every time that you meet, God speaks to us and He always has a word for each one of us. And the word of God can never leave us the same. So even tonight, as we go to the word of God, I want you to believe that God is speaking something in your spirit and it cannot leave you the same. It may not uh, change anything immediately, but it speaks to the spirit man because we are spirits and it doesn't leave the spirit man uh, uh, the same. So today I am uh, so excited to be here and because I'm not alone in the studio, I am accompanied by a friend of mine and a pastor, a fellow minister of the gospel, I promise you a good teacher of the work, and I am so, so honored that our Pastor Benefeta, you are able to be with us. Thank you. And we know that it's not in vain that you are here even today. Amen. So I want us to just pray, and uh, then I will usher in Pastor Benefeta to continue. We can pray together. Father, we thank you for yet another opportunity and another platform to share your word. And we thank you because your word cannot come back to the void. And so it will accomplish, even today, it will accomplish that which you have sent it forth to accomplish. And we thank you for your servant, uh, Pastor Ben Fetcher, as he brings the word. He's only a vessel, but you know, Holy Spirit, you are speaking your very words through him. We bless you for everyone who is listening now and those who will even tune in later and will be able to listen because your word cannot lose its power and it will still bless them. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And uh, let me just, uh, I think, allow Pastor to introduce himself properly and then continue with your teaching. Amen. Wow. Thank, Thank you, you for, for such an honor, Pastor Lucy. Uh, I'm so delighted to be part of the Marvelous Believers show. I think this is my first time to be a guest in this show. and. Uh, I consider it as a very, very wonderful opportunity to share the gospel. So as you've heard, my name is uh, Ben Fetcher, and uh, I am a co-minister with Pastor Lucy Lepore, and uh, we minister the gospel of Christ. And today we are here not for any other thing, but again to talk about Jesus. Because when you talk about the gospel, when you talk about ministering the gospel, it's all about Jesus. The Bible says that... Uh, uh, it's Jesus, it is in him we live, it is in him we move, it is in him we have our being. So having known that, that it is all about him, then the gospel is all about him, then it's good to know him because as we know him, we are transformed and we are changed into the same image. And uh, today we are going to talk about uh, or to have a discussion of something that is very, very important, something that is very, uh, very good and something that goes around in the minds of men. They, they, they talk about it and they wonder about it. Uh, the thing to do with the believers and the issue of sin, the issue of confession, the issue of grace, all those matters because some people feel like... Uh, it is true you talk about the cross. It is true that you talk about the finished works of Christ. It is true that you preach the gospel. But I still feel like uh, I need to do something about my sins. I need to do something about God's forgiveness. I need to do something to be in good books with God. And I know by now, most of the people who follow this program, you have been established in the reality of what Christ has done because the gospel is all about Christ Jesus. And I want to start uh, with a verse. I know there is the, the common verse that we'll get to in the first John chapter 1 from verse 9, from verse 8. But I want us first to go to first, uh, not first, but the book of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Romans chapter 5 from verse 17. And I'm reading from the, uh, the New King James Version. Romans chapter 5 from verse 17. The Bible says, for uh, if by the one man's offense, 
dead range through the one man. Much more, these uh, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. It is good to, re- uh, to look at that verse uh, step by step. He says, for if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one. So the Bible tells us that it is not by every man's offense that death reigned. It is not by every man's sin or disobedience that uh, that people become sinners. So with that, we understand that you are not a sinner because of yourself. You are not a sinner because of what you did. You are not a sinner because of anything you committed. The Bible is clear. It tells us for by the one man's offense. And if you drop uh, to verse 19, he says, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. So the Bible introduces two major men, and uh, he says that by one man's disobedience, uh, many were made sinners. So what I would like you to realize, even as we proceed with this, uh, with this uh, show, or this program, is that the first thing you must understand is that sin is not your initiative. Sin is not your problem. Sin is not something that started with you. You are not the source of sin. You are not the, the beginning point of sin. So you should not be worried about it. Why? Because it is by one man's disobedience that sin came. Not by your disobedience. You're not a sinner because you disobeyed. So you inherited that sin. So if it is not your initiative, then it will also not be your initiative to solve the issue of sin. Praise God. It is not your initiative to bring sin. It is also not your initiative to solve the issue of sin. So the issue of sin, uh, the one who brings it is the first Adam. Then the one who takes it is the last Adam. You are not or the second Adam. There, there is no place where you are mentioned. Praise God. So when you talk about sin, you are not actually in the picture. The one who is in the picture of sin is the one who brought it in and the one who takes it away. Praise God. Now, Verse 17 again, he says, by one man's offense, death reigned through the one. This death was a result of sin, and this death is being separated from God. So because of that man who sinned, what came to you is to be separated from God. What you received from that man is being separated from God. That is death. Then he says, much more, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Now he introduces the other man who comes now to deal with the issue of sin. There is this common verse uh, that is in John chapter 3, verse 16, where the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So the one who came to deal with the issue of sin is not you because again, you are not the one who brought sin. But it is until you understand what we are talking about when we talk about sin. Sin is not what you do. Sin is what you are. Sin is not a verb. Sin is a noun. It's a condition. It's a, it's a place. It's the name of something. It's a name of a thing. It's a place where we found ourselves. Praise God. Because of that one man who is Adam. Now, part two says, much more, those who receive abundance of grace. Hallelujah. So you are brought into the place of sin, separation from God. But now he brings in another, uh, another thing called abundance of grace. So, so uh, when Jesus came, who is the one who comes to deal with the issue of sin, as the last Adam, he comes with something called grace. And what is grace? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Praise God. Because of the sin that you inherited through Adam, you did not deserve to have a good relationship with God or you did not deserve to enjoy fellowship with God. But now with, the, with, with this uh, last Adam coming with grace, grace now brings you to the place where you can have uh, 
a relationship with God. And as if that was not enough, says, and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So the one who comes now as the solution for the sin, solution for what uh, the first Adam brought in, he comes with grace and righteousness. Praise God. And he says of the gift of righteousness. So whenever we talk about sin, whenever we talk about Adam, whenever we talk about uh, uh, being separated from God, the solution now is brought in by grace. So grace, what is grace? It's good to understand what is grace. Grace is the way God relates to us. And it's the only way that we can have a relationship with God. So the the issue of sin, whenever you see the issue of sin or whenever sins comes up, the only way to have it solved and to have it uh, removed and to have it dealt with is through this thing we call abundance of grace, which is, uh, which is a gift which comes through Jesus Christ. He says in John chapter, chapter 1 from verse 17, he says that the law was given by Moses, but the grace uh, but the grace of God came through Jesus Christ. So the coming of Jesus was the coming of grace. Praise God. So the issue of sin is not solved by you. Neither is it uh, solved by you trying to inform God how sinful you, you are. Neither is it solved by you beating yourself on the chest and saying, God, please forgive me. Please uh, take away my sins. No, 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 no. Actually, the Bible says when John saw Jesus, he, he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He didn't say, behold the Lamb of God that you will ask him to take away your sins. No, it's not about your asking. It's about his initiative. Just in the same way, the the bringing in of sin was not your initiative, but it was Adam's initiative. So in the same way, the taking away of sin is not man's initiative, it is God's initiative. But what we see in the Old Testament is like man used to offer sacrifices to cover up their sins. But you realize that the law which they were using at that time was not the original plan of God. The Bible in the book of Galatians says that the law was added. It was an addendum. It was not the, in the initial plan of God. But in the plan of God is that he will have, you'll have a solution for sin, which is eternal, which is permanent, not to cover up your sin, but to take away your sins. And that is what the, the, the last Old Testament prophet said. That is John. He said, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So who takes away the sins of the world? It is the Lamb of God. It is Jesus Christ. Praise God. And he does that and we receive that by the gift of his grace. Praise be to God. So it is good to understand that, that it is not your initiative. It is God's initiative. Praise God. Now, uh, we can go to the book of First John chapter 1, verse 9. But before that, <laughs> let me say something. When we talk about grace, many people think like uh, we are giving licenses to sin. There are some misconceptions about grace. And the first misconception about grace is that people think like we are giving people a license to sin. Well, it's good uh, to tell you that... Uh, uh, the people you see all around you, they are sinning well, well, without any license. They, they don't need to be given any license. They are sinning without a license. Why? Because that is what Adam brought in, the issue of sin. So it is not a license that we give. Actually, when we talk about the grace of God, the grace of God is the cure for sin. It is not a license. It is not, the, it is not the, the grace of God that gives people the freedom to live in sin. It is the grace of God that sets people free from sin. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 6 verse 14, uh, sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law but you are under grace, praise God. So the law, the Bible says again in the book of Romans chapter seven, that I was dead until the law came. I was alive until the law came. And when the law came, sin revived and I died, praise God. So it is the law that br brings in the revival of sin. But when grace comes, the grace of God comes to take away sin. Actually, I say this, the law, uh, only diagnoses the sickness, which is sin. 
shows you how evil you are, shows you how unworthy you are, shows you how you cannot keep the law. And that was the perfect purpose of the law, to show you how you cannot keep it. But now, after the law diagnoses the sin, the, the sickness, grace now comes to cure. For example, the law tells you, do not commit adultery, and it leaves you at that point. Then grace comes and tells you that uh, it, it gives you the spirit of life, which is the love of God working inside you. So the law leaves you at the place where it gives you a command, do not commit adultery. But the law, but the, the, but the spirit, the grace of God comes and gives you life from within you and gives you love from within you such that you don't have any place to commit adultery. The law tells you do not kill, but leaves you at that point. But grace now comes and gives you love, ministers love, the love that is uh, shared in us broadly by the, the Holy Spirit, praise God. And that through that, and now that uh, through that love, you cannot kill because you are full of love. So that misconception that grace is just but a license to sin, it is not true because grace is the empowerment to live a godly life. Actually, uh, Paul says in the book of Titus chapter 2 from verse 11 to 14, that the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching them to do what? To deny ungodliness. So the grace is the grace of God that saves. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, for it is by grace we are saved through faith. And the same grace that saves us is the same grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness. So uh, what am I saying? I'm saying that it is not the grace that gives people licenses to sin. The grace of God empowers us to live above sin. So now we go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Because this is a question that goes around circles, especially by the people uh, uh, directed to the people that talk about uh, the people that talk about the grace of God because people feel like you are taking the grace of God too far and it's like you are, you are allowing people to sin anyhow. And you are saying that God has forgiven us all our sins, and which is the truth. And people feel like, no, I need to confess my sins again and again and again and again. But let's go to First uh, John chapter 1. I'll read from, okay, we can start all the way from verse 1, but because of time, I'll read from verse 8. It says, if, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, uh, when John was writing this book, I know there are so many schools of thought. Some people think like uh, he was... Uh, writing it, addressing believers who are born again. Others think like he was writing and addressing uh, unbelievers. But at this time when this was being written, there had arose in the church some people, some guys had come in, crept into the church, and they were saying that it's like they were saying no one needs to believe, no one needs to confess, no one needs to, to do anything, everyone is okay. Praise God that Christ has dealt with sin completely. No one needs to do anything. Everyone is okay. But John came to address this and he said, wait a minute. Everyone is not okay. Now, he says in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, because they were feeling like because Jesus died, then no one has sin in him. But John had to address this in this church. He said, if we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we cannot say that we have not, that we have no sin because we will be de uh, deceiving ourselves. Then he says, if we confess, that word confess there means to acknowledge, to acknowledge. So if we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. So those people who are living by that time and those, uh, those they are called Gnostics, they, who had crept in, they had brought in another doctrine saying that you don't have to even acknowledge that you're a sinner. You don't have to 
you, you are just okay just as you are. But now John had to come and correct this and say, no, not everyone is okay. You have to acknowledge that you are a sinner. And by that one, we mean that you have to acknowledge that you are helpless by yourself, that you, are, you need a savior. Because if you still think like you are comfortable, you are okay, you don't need a savior, you don't need anything, then that is wrong. So he had to address that and he said, you, everyone has to acknowledge. And now this is where we come to the point of believing. Because there are some people, actually even today, there are some people who teach something called inclusionism. And they say, you don't need to believe. You, you don't need to do anything. You are okay. The, the whole world is okay. No, the whole world is not okay. Everyone must acknowledge that they, are, they have fallen short praise God, and that they are sinners. They have sinned. They have, they have sinned. You know, this word of this, uh, this, there are two words that are used in verse 8. He says, if we say we have no sin, uh, that sin is not in plural. That sin is in singular, and that is a nature. So that is the nature of sin. So if we say we have no nature of sin, just like that from nowhere, we say we have no nature of sin. We are deceiving ourselves. Then in verse 9, he says, we have if, if we confess our sins, if we confess that we, uh, we, ha we have fallen short of the standards of God, if we acknowledge that we are sinful, if we acknowledge that we are separated from God, then he says, mm -hmm. he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does that mean? That when we acknowledge that we need a savior, when we acknowledge that we are not okay, then God is faithful and just to do what? To forgive us. Praise God. And to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that is very key. It is very important to understand what the, the writer is saying. He's saying that when we acknowledge, what happens is that we are forgiven. We receive the forgiveness of sins. And he says, we are cleansed from all unrighteousness. How many times do we need to be cleansed from all unrighteousness? Once. It is only once. So at this point, the writer was addressing some group of, of people who are not even born again, who had not believed in the gospel. And they were uh, perpetuating a wrong message saying that you don't need to to believe anything, you are just okay. But he says, you have to acknowledge that you need a savior. And when you do that, you receive the forgiveness of sins and you are cleansed from all unrighteousness. So how many times are we cleansed from all unrighteousness? We are cleansed once and for all. The Bible says, again, where we read in Romans chapter 5, verse 17, that those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift, of righteousness. Notice the article there. The article there. He says of the gift. He didn't say those who receive the abundance of grace. If you read your, your Bible carefully, he didn't say those who receive the abundance of grace. He says those who receive abundance of grace because it is possible for grace to be multiplied in your life as you grow in the knowledge of Christ. So it is possible for you to experience multiplied grace. But when it comes to righteousness, he uses the article there, as in you cannot grow uh, to become more righteous. You cannot become less righteous. It is definite. It is article as it is. It has an article there. This is the only righteousness. So when he talks about being cleansed from all unrighteousness, so when you are cleansed from all unrighteousness, the moment you acknowledge Christ, the moment you acknowledge that you need a savior, you are cleansed from all unrighteousness. You receive the perfect gift, the eternal gift, the, the gift of righteousness. Praise God. You receive the gift of righteousness. Now, Look at how now he addresses the believers in 1 John chapter 2. After addressing those guys who had uh, uh, thought like we are okay, now he comes to the believers and he tells them in 1 John chapter 2 from verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So, 
to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the saints, to the believers, to the children of God, to the children who have believed in the gospel. The solution is not confessing your sins. It's not even mentioning your sins. How does he address this issue of sin to the believers? He says, I write to you so that you may not sin. That, and if anyone sins, he didn't say confess your sins. He says, we have an advocate with the Father. Remember what I said as I was beginning, that the solution for sin is not uh, with man. The solution for sin is with Christ Jesus. So if a, a righteous person, if a believer, these little children as he's referring them uh, in 1 John chapter 2, if they sin, if they make a mistake, if they sin, he is not telling them to do anything about it. He is telling them to focus on their advocate. Praise God. He says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So, if you have not believed in Jesus Christ, you need to acknowledge that you are still in sin and you are a sinner. But the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you are cleansed from all unrighteousness. And now if you sin as a believer, if you sin, as he says, if you sin and you are a son of God, stop pointing at yourself. Stop looking for what to do for your sins because that is the wrong way of dealing with your sins. When you sin and if in one sins, focus on the advocate who is Jesus Christ and he says he is the uh, he is the righteous and he himself is the propitiation for our sins the first adam brought sin the last adam became the propitiation for our sins so the solution for sin is not in yourself it's not in your confession it is in your advocate who took away your sins hallelujah that is it and i call you blessed Thank you so much, Pastor Lucy, for giving me that opportunity. Wow. Yes, we are blessed. And uh, indeed, eh, we went a bit deep. I thank God for you and for the grace, especially to teach. Uh, if you missed our, our episode last week, you could visit it. I had promised you we would go deeper, and I think we have gone. And I felt like, as Pastor was preaching, I felt like if you are there, and the devil has been accusing you. I told you the devil is called the accuser of brethren. So even as he was speaking, as far as I was speaking, I felt like telling somebody there, something that I have ever been taught. Anytime you, you are found in a situation and you think this is risky to talk, just tell them, talk to my lawyer. We have an advocate. Tell the devil, talk to my lawyer. Mm. I have an advocate. I have someone Hallelujah. who prays for it. Hallelujah. It is not about me. I did not originate with sin. I did not solve the sin of mankind. Talk to the one who paid the price. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we are so blessed. Thank Indeed, you. We have learned so much. The law was put just to touch us to grace because there is nothing you can do about the law but it helps you to know that you just need the grace so that you can you can be declared righteous by grace so we are blessed and uh, i believe we shall be able to have pastor again we need to just continue i don't know to which direction but i believe uh, we'll be able to have him again thank you for keeping it to emma tv this is the marvelous believer show and um you are blessed. Let's meet next week as we continue with this episode.